I had a venture capitalist when I was first raising our, um, our, our first round of, of venture capital and came in and he was trying to get to know me and he told me this story. He said, Brock, I've never seen someone be a successful, successful family man and a successful CEO at the same time. You either got to choose one or the other. And, uh, and that didn't sit very well with me. Um, and in that moment, I knew he was not the right partner to work with. And it also in that moment, not maybe in that direct moment, but um, in the days after that where I, I really thought that comment just bugged me so much and it motivated, it created this immense amount of motivation for me that I'm going to show not only him but others that you can be a great family man and a, a great CEO and do it to, at the same time. Welcome to Seeking Excellence. I'm Brett Pinniger. In my work, I help executives and teams be their best and achieve remarkable results. Reduce time to market, more rapid growth, higher levels of profitability, along with a better quality of life. Learn more about my coaching, peer groups, and training programs at brettpinniger.com. You can also follow me on social media at Brett Pinniger. Check the show notes for all the specifics. Seeking excellence is all about helping us understand what makes leaders that are striving to be their best tick. What are their beliefs or mindsets about how the world works? What motivates them? And how do they bring their best to their work? And then we take those insights and uncover things we can all do to live and lead with more intention. If you enjoy this podcast, we would appreciate it if you take the time to rate, review, and share it with others. Before we begin today's episode, I'd like to invite you to a special webinar on May 17th, where we will be discussing the neuroscience of excellence and how we need to overcome our addiction to average in order to reach our potential. I think you'll love it. Today's guest is Brock Blake, the CEO of Lendio. Lendio is a small business loan marketplace dedicated to helping small businesses get access to multiple loan opportunities and to be able to select the right one for their business. During our conversation, Brock talks about the pivots that Lendio has made and where it is today. He shares the insights of how he builds mission and inspires it by engaging his team to share stories of customer successes. He talks about failing fast and how important that is for their success. He also shares a personal story about trying to find balance between being a great dad and a great leader and how he believes he can do both. There's much more to our conversation, so let's jump right in. Brock, it's a pleasure to be with you today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Brett. Yeah, it's great. Well, I wonder if we could start out with just a quick introduction to you and to Lendio. Yeah, so um, Brock Blake, founder and CEO of Lendio. Uh, Lendio is a small business loan marketplace. Uh, so you might think about Kayak or Expedia. We do that for business loans. So a business owner will come to us, and I'm talking business owner, we're talking r Main Street, restaurant owners, landscapers, dry cleaners. They come to us, fill out one application, and get access to about 75 lenders on our platform. Each of those lenders will then submit an offer, and then that business owner can comparison shop the rate, the term, the payment amount, and choose the loan that best fits them. Um, we, at Lendio, we talk what drives us. We talk about fueling the American dream. So that's what that means is you've got these millions of small business owners who have this idea, passion to help or to grow their business, to hire employees, to expand to a new location, some vision or goal for the future, but they need capital to be able to do that. And before Lendio, they might go bank to bank to bank, applying for a loan, getting their credit pulled, and it's a bad, painful experience. And so we've tried to simplify all of that, make it easy, come to one place, get access to all these loan options. and. Uh, when you help these business owners get access to capital and they tell you your story, it, it is, uh, it's a really meaningful, um, satisfying work that we're doing. And, and uh, so that's a little bit about Lendio that's and great. what we're trying to accomplish. Give us a sense of the scale of the business. How many, I mean, whatever metrics would make sense to share. I mean, how could we sort of get a sense for your impact? Yeah, so we have funded uh, just under a um, billion dollars of loans. 
Oh, that's great. Um, at an average loan size of $50,000. So, I mean, that's uh, a lot of uh, tens of thousands of small businesses across the country. And um, we have about 150 employees, uh, 100 here in, in uh, South Jordan, uh, 50 in our New York office. And uh, growing um, this last year, you know, we grew, you know, just under 100% year over year. Um, and so we're, we're, it's a big market, big opportunity. Um, and we're doing some, some good things. That's great. Well, I think you already raised one of the key issues I wanted to talk about today, which is purpose. One of the things that leaders need to do is to establish the purpose of the business, to explain why we're doing what we're doing. Why are we climbing this mountain that we're climbing here? And it sounds like you got, have got a great purpose here. Did it start out that way, or did you sort of get into that as your sort of fundamental purpose? Well, early on, you know, our purpose, I mean, I didn't quantify it or, uh, you know, I couldn't articulate it exactly the way we do today, but um, it was, I've always been passionate about business owners and entrepreneurs and helping them get access to capital. Uh, before Lendio, I had started a company called Funding Universe. Mm -hmm. A lot of people in Utah are familiar with it because we did so many events and things here. But what we were doing is we were connecting entrepreneurs to investors, angels and venture capitalists. And um, we would do that through these speed pitching events, like speed dating meets yep. venture capital. And, uh, and we were, you know, helping these business owners, they would, they would um, to try and get access to capital in that way. And, and, and it was a satisfying, you know, and, and very both satisfying and painful learning experience to go through with that business because you learn that um, most businesses are not going to raise angel or venture capital. Uh, most businesses are these main street businesses, and they're not going to be the next Uber, Square, Twitter, Facebook. Um, in fact, only about 1% of businesses mm -hmm. actually raise venture capital. Most need 50 or 100 or $150,000. And um, so, you know, we, um, I knew there was a, a need to help business owners get access to capital. But we were solving it in the wrong way, in my opinion. And that's when, you know, I started to kind of realize, man, instead of focusing on the 1%, let's focus on the 99%, right? And, uh, and we shut down Funding Universe and launched Lendio in 2011. And it, with, with the goal of let's help small business owners. And that has really expanded into this vision of, you know, we say fuel the American dream, and and it's not a, that's, it's not a tagline. It is it is real. Yeah. Um, and uh, it is making a difference in the lives of these small business owners, and and you know because we believe the small business owners are kind of the backbone of the the economy here. Um, so we, we can help make an impact with that. That is absolutely the case. And it's interesting to see how the, the, really the purpose has stayed the same, and then the, the pivot is around the strategy and around where you're focusing in order to make the biggest difference for the purpose. That's right. When you look at your company today and your team here, what are you doing to inspire them with this vision, with this purpose? Are there specific ways in which you go about helping the team really capture what this is all about? Well, every month we have an all-hands meeting and uh, where I like to remind, there's remind the team of what we're doing. Um, and we do that in a few different ways. First is we, we put it out there of um, what does fueling the American dream mean? And we connect the dots and we try and, um, and what by do, to do that, we share customer stories. Mm. So um, either customer videos or like this last company meeting, which was Thursday, we had eight of our frontline customer service team members stand up and each give a one to two minute story and say, I worked with a business owner in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and here was their challenge. And this is what I needed to help them accomplish. And, and this is how we helped them get a loan. And, and this is the result of that. Yeah. And so you tell the stories, um, and so you realize it comes to life. You know, if you're a, an engineer, you may not be able to be customer facing every day, but that way you you realize, man, what I did made an impact. Yeah. Um, so we try and tell the customer stories as often as as we can, um, and 
but then we also try and tie it. I'll, I'll I try and tie it back to kind of um, macroeconomic stats, and, and so. Um, for every, you know, we have a goal of funding um, basically a, a billion dollars of loans in one year. And when we accomplish that, that will represent about $11 billion of economic impact to, across the United States. And, and I kind of just try and, and put that into perspective of what, of what type of impact $11 billion yeah. is on the economy. So... From the smallest level, from a customer story to a macro level of you know economic impact, and kind of try and connect the dots in between. That's 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 what we do. Love it, love it. How do you think that focus on purpose and helping employees really feel connected to the purpose, whether they're an engineer or on the front lines, how's that impacted your ability to be successful as a business? Do you see that there are tangible benefits of being so purpose driven? No question. Um, you know, it is part of. Uh, it's a common thread that kind of connects all of the, our team members together is that we're all passionate about that purpose. And uh, I believe in, um, we're very protective of the culture that we have here and that you know we only want team members that, I, I believe that the most talented individuals in, in, in whatever is if they're doing something they're passionate about. And, um, and so, you know, if, we, not that every single person is extremely passionate about solving this major problem, but when you connect that dot and you help them see the impact we're doing, it just becomes not just a job where you're checking in eight to five, it just creates meaning to it and, and um, it creates their best, I believe, our, all of our collective kind of best work. I think that's right. Well, in fact, Gallup did a really interesting study, and they do it every year or every couple of years, where they look at employee engagement, and they really establish what are the key drivers of an engaged employee. And having meaning or purpose is one of the primary ways you can do that. And what's interesting about that is when an employee is engaged, they're probably between one and a half and two times as productive as they are when they're either not really engaged or actively disengaged. Employee turnover, much lower. Employee satisfaction, much higher. Customer satisfaction, much higher. Do you see any sorts of the, any benefits like that in your business? Yeah, no question. I, um, you know, you just said kind of customer satisfaction. We have thousands of customer reviews of, you know, five-star reviews of them going through our experience. And, 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 our, and our team members take pride in, you know, when they get a customer review or, or um, you know, or, or the opposite. Um, we had a great story this last week where a business owner came in looking for financing. There was a misunderstanding. They put a review on there that said, I've read all these other reviews that say it's an amazing experience. Mine wasn't so amazing. And our head of um, customer experience immediately reached out to that customer, apologized, you know, we're so sorry, I'm, you know, there was a misunderstanding. We want to make it up to you. Let us, you know, figure out how to take good care of you. And, um, and uh, because we deal with thousands of business owners right. every month. And it turned literally um, two days later, that customer went online and wrote the most amazing kind of review of, um, and so of, of how, you know, if you know, the customer had slipped through the cracks or whatever had happened, and, and, but we reached out and we, we made it right, and, and you turn a negative experience into an overwhelming positive experience. And I guess that goes back to the passion of, of um, you know, there's meaning in your work, and, and, that, and uh, there's meaning in taking good care of that customer and helping them get access to capital. I mean, yeah, I, I yeah. see those tangible results in a lot of different ways. That's, that's just one example. You know, it's so interesting is that there are a lot of companies out there where um, purpose isn't a top driver for them. And they kind of, oh, purpose, don't really need it. Just give me the number. We just got to hit the number. And the very numbers are results driven. And I think there's an opportunity for to see how you can add to that by adding purpose to results as a way to sort of make the business even better for your employees, for your customers, for you as an owner of the business. Yeah, I think that the numbers, I mean, that's all a part of it, right? To me, that's the scorecard. Mm -hmm. um, and so you start with person, pa purpose and passion around, you know, what are, we, what are we really, what are we accomplishing here? How are we making a difference in this world? And then, you know, and, and, but, but you have to be able to build a long-term sustainable business. You have to be able to drive revenue. You have to be able to, to drive profits. You have to be able to do those things. 
Um, because if you don't, then the organization goes away and you're not actually fulfilling your purpose. Um, so you connect those dots and say, okay, it starts with purpose, but we, you know, if we do a great job with the purpose, it's gonna, the scorecard is gonna be here are these financial results. And if we do great with these financial resorts, it's going to drive back to our purpose. You right. just try and connect those dots, right? Right. right. Well, let's then take the uh, results in a different direction because right. you've mentioned a couple of times this pivot that you've had between funding universe and then the first version of Lendio, maybe the second version of Lendio here. And those are important pivots, and every organization pivots. It's just a part of life here. When you think about your process for becoming aware of the issue and then determining the best ways to solve it and be getting creative and innovative about how to solve the problem, and then your implementation of that. I'll call that kind of a learning and adapting loop, where companies get really good at learning and adapting are more likely to be successful in the long term. What were some of the key things that you did to, um, to get good at being aware and to not let this problem of, like, we're focusing on the 1% versus the 99% go on too long? Um fail faster than everyone else. I mean, I know a lot of people use that fail fast. Um, you know, I heard this analogy and I've used it a few times as of late. Um, for the video game players out there, I'm not a huge video game player, but in, you know, in I think everyone's played Mario Brothers where you, you get on there and the first thing you see is this little turtle guy coming by and you run into the turtle guy and you die. And you learn, oh, I can't run into the turtle guy. I got to jump over him. And then the next time you jump over the turtle guy and you fall in the pit, you die. And you realize, oh man, I can't fall in the pit. I got it. And you, you learn, you o the only way you're going to pass that level or in that video game is you got to die a bunch of times to figure it out. Um, and so sometimes in business, um, it's, it's that way. It's like, man, we got we to gotta make m mistakes faster than everyone else, yeah. and we got to learn from them and just try not to do that again. Um, and so I think embracing that if you're not making mistakes, then you're not really progressing. or put. And, and how do you empower your team members to feel that same way, where it's like, you know what, We're gonna, we'll, make, we'll make mistakes, and some are actually going to be really painful. Um, everyone says fell fast until it's really painful and then it sucks. But, um, you know, how do you respond to that? Uh, do you say fell fast and then they make a mistake and you berate them, you know, and you get upset out of, you know, how do you respond to that? Be able to say, hey, great learning opportunity. Uh, you know, let's make sure it doesn't happen again. Let's grow from it and be better the next time. And, and so I think it's in how you handle that uh, failure or those mistakes um, allows you to, to to, to grow. What do you think it is for you as a leader that allows you to um, not be the person who berates the employee? What is it about your style or your approach that allows you to say, hey, let's learn from this, let's do it better next time, but let's get right back at it? Where does that come from for you? That's a great question. Where does that come from? I mean, it's just born into who I am. Um, and so it must come from my parents, um, from my upbringing. Um, you know, I'm just passionate about people uh, and their success and their growth. And sometimes I might be err the on the wrong side of that, um, where you you I might avoid conflict. You know, even sometimes, mm -hmm. and that could be a, a weakness. But uh, I. I think it's just that the passion for people and seeing them progress and grow. Um, so it must uh, must come from my upbringing. I, I have, uh, so yeah, tell me a little ahead. bit about your parents and tell me a little bit about what it was like that you think probably created that mindset for you. So interesting thing about my family. So my mom um, grew up extremely poor, uh, very, very poor, a single mother, and who worked all the time and and so she, everything that she did she had to do on her own and so she has this crazy innate personality of being creative and not letting anything get in her way um, she wanted to go to prom she didn't have the money to buy the dress she would she would literally go to the store look at it and then go home and sew it and the, her own dress um, my my dad um, and so she and she was a school teacher, 
my dad is a psychologist um, and he just has this deep passion for people. Uh, and so that combination has created some, um, and, I, and I say this just to help give perspective of my upbringing, uh, in, in where there's, there's five boys and one girl, my, my sister's the oldest. Uh, her husband is a, um, the president of a very successful um, financial brokerage. My oldest brother is the CEO of a half a billion dollar company in Texas. Next brother is a marketing exec, was at Walmart, now EA Sports. Next brother is a CEO of a company. Next brother is a patent attorney and then me as a CEO. So whatever they did, it created that combination of people and just, you know, never say die or creativity or whatever has instilled into my siblings this and very competitive, mm -hmm. right? This uh, this drive, this drive that um, that has kind of just been ingrained into our our upbringing. That's powerful, and I think that a lot of people um, really yearn for that kind of a of a drive and that sort of a focus because not all of us had that upbringing. It, it's very much driven by different things for different people. So let's imagine one of the listeners out here saying, boy, I wish I had Brock's sort of enthusiasm for life and that I became more of a, uh, less of a victim and more of a sort of a, a, a creator. Let me create the future I want and not let anything get in my way. What advice would you give to somebody who's now 30, 40 years old and is now trying to adapt or to adopt this kind of a mindset? Yeah, so... Um you know, I, I think I would just describe some of the things that um, that that I do that have helped me with that. Um, you know, I start off, you know, I, and I've tried to make a you try and build a system around this. I, I don't think you can do anything until you figure out how to how do I make this to be long term. Like I don't just do it for a day and then mm -hmm. I'm done, right? Um, you know, so some of those things that that have helped me to create kind of this zest for life um you know i think morning kind of study time or meditation time um, early in the morning um, a time uh, where I, to go work out and to exercise and get outside and sweat and you know and and push yourself and uh, compete um, in different ways um, time with your family um, my wife and, and we have four kids and there are different activities and connecting with them, putting the cell phone down and trying to be there in the moment. Um, and, uh, and that includes, you know, dinner each night and some of those things. And one-on-one uh, -on -one time with your spouse, a uh, weekly date or, or things like that. Um, and, and then when you're at work, um, you know, I believe that in balance, you should have a very balanced life. But when you're at work, man, you are, you are at it, and you're. I mean, every minute of that day, you're just trying to, to drive as much value as you possibly can. And and um, I, I think that some people try and work. You know, burn the midnight oil in the morning and and late late at night, and and they get burnt out and tired and worn out. And there's times where you have to be able to do that, but I think that if you, you if you have balance in your life, then the time at work, even if it may not be, you know, 15 hours a day, uh, if it's 10 hours a day, but those 10 hour day those 10 hour days are going to be more productive than a, someone's 15 hour day just because you're at your you know you're on. Um, and then and then the balance of being able to get away from work every once in a while and shut it off and go to Lake Powell or wherever on vacation and, and have time to think and decompress and, re, you know, rejuvenate yourself. And um, so, you know, for me, those are some of the things, you know, and there's, there's uh, you know, a personal uh, spiritual connection and religious connection as well for me that rejuvenates me on a weekly basis where I can, uh, you know, stop, you know, kind of some of the other things and, and uh, try and be uplifted in other ways. And I think that that balance, and it doesn't have to be that, that's mine. Mm -hmm. Someone else is going to have a completely different balance. But thinking about how do, I, how do I progress, how do I 
is you know studying, reading, exercising, you know, balance, family. Um, I think that's been a good recipe for me. That's fantastic. Here, do you feel like um, are, are there mantras or things where you actually sort of intentionally go back and think about it, or does this mentality just really sort of ooze and sort of flow through all of these sort of sort of recharging and rejuvenating activities you're involved in? You just learn over time, um, but I'm but I'm definitely very. Um, um, What's the word I want to use? I'm um, I'm intentional. Yeah, very intentional about that, and uh, I've I've tried to you know on a very regular basis, whether it's quarterly or annually, kind of take a step back and evaluate how I'm spending my time and am I spending it on the most important the things that matter most to me. And uh, building a great business matters a great deal to me but not at the expense of my family and, and other things. Um, and, you know, it's, I'll just tell this quick story. Go for it. I had a venture capitalist when I was first raising our, um, our, our first round of, of venture capital. I came in, and he was trying to get to know me, and he told me this story. He said, Brock, I've never seen someone be a successful, successful family man and a successful CEO at the same time. You either got to choose one or the other. And, uh, and that didn't sit very well with me. Um, and in that moment, I knew he was not the right partner to work with. And it also in that moment, not maybe in that direct moment, but um, in the days after that where I, I really thought that comment just bugged me so much and it motivated, it created this immense amount of motivation for me that I'm going to show not only him but others that you can be a great family man and a, a great CEO and do it to, at the same time. And, uh, and I'm not sure if I'm great at either one, um, but I, I am uh, intentionally uh, doing my best to, to hopefully receive that, um, that title or, or uh, you know, not recognition, I'm not doing it for anyone else, but I, I want to be able to show that you can do that. You can prove that. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's interesting. It's several of the people that I've interviewed so far. I've talked a lot about the, the power of and, not or. This or that. It's power of this and that. Uh, and it's, it's interesting to see how, as we think there is more possibility, that we can actually accomplish so much more than if we feel like we have to trade off this for that, where we settle for something much less than what's possible. And Amen. it's great to see it, great to see it here. So let's now come back to sort of your leadership style and uh, uh, talk a little bit about how it's evolved over time. If you were to kind of take the clock back 10 or 15, 20 years and describe you as a leader and the leader you are today, what have been some of the fundamental changes for you in your approach to leadership? Well, first of all, it's around motivation. I think early on in my career, it, uh, you know, you'd go read those entrepreneur magazine stories, and you'd see the guy that, or guy or gal that uh, built a business, sold it, and drove off in the sunset with, you know, their Ferrari or Lamborghini or whatever it was, and you're, man, that would be awesome. <laughs> and uh, you know, I think early on, you know, I thought about that a lot, and I always kind of talked about it. I'm going to build this business, I'm going to sell it, and then we'll go see what else we're going to do. And uh, quite a few years ago, I'm not sure how long ago, but I had a really pretty significant change of heart in, in that it wasn't about building it to sell it um, because that drives short-term thinking. And, and um, you know, it's about building a great business that solves a problem. And, uh, and hopefully it's a 100-year business. Um, and that doesn't mean it won't be sold. Uh, but when it's sold, hopefully it will, it will even progress further so it can be a 100-year business. But you're building something of value. And that really changed my outlook on the decisions I was making. And, and um, you know, and, and it's not a, always a, a, a short-term decision to optimize the results in the short run. It might be a decision I'm making today that I believe is going to have an impact on the business three years down the road. And some, some people may not appreciate that or recognize it for what it is or question that decision um, but but uh, I you know you 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 know why you made the decision and you stick with it and usually it pays off in the end um, so that's one of the I think m 
significant uh, changes I've had from early on in my career. To, to what do you think motivated that? You talked about how there was this moment where you realized that no longer was the exit the most important thing, that was building something of value. Um, through a lot of experiences um, and a lot of, you know, I, I don't know, a lot, maturity. Uh, again, I don't think there was one moment of time um, but seeing, you know, you're trying to solve a problem and, you know, you, you try and solve it one way and it may not, it may not drive the, the value you want, or it may not create the customer experience you want, or it may not, and you learn, you like, and then you see and you do it the right way and you realize, wow, that was pretty awesome. And it was very satisfying and we got this result and, and, and you just, I don't know, you take a step back and you, and there's just some maturity there, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Sometimes it's the outside influences in our life that cause us to th begin to see the world differently. And, uh, and for me, that's been the case. Um, I'll meet somebody who has a profound impact on me. Somebody like, whoa, you know, they see the world differently. And I'll learn from them and go, maybe I need to take a step back. And so this concept of connecting with people, mentors, heroes, and then taking a step back and say, well, what can I learn and what do I need to get into my life in order to improve my game? When you look at your life and look at your sort of sense of who you are, other than the family, looking outside of the, the great upbringing you had, um, heroes, mentors that have made a big difference for you? Um, outside of the family. Uh, and Well, maybe it's interesting to think about why that's a hard question to answer. I mean, what is it about... It, it, the family was just profoundly um, inspiring. It sounds like. Yeah, my my sib my brothers and I mean my siblings have been a, had a major impact on my life as well. Um, but I've I've talked a little bit about them. Um, you know, I look to people that um, I'll mention a, a few different individuals that have had an impact on me. Um, you know, I think Mitt Romney's had an impact on me, you know, and people are to be like, oh, you know, the Mormon uh, presidential candidate, you know. Uh, but just the way he went about and carried, carried about his business and handled criticism and, and seems like, from my perspective, I think he's tried to do everything he's done and done very, been very successful at it. With, he's done it with class. Um, and he is in, you know... He's a family man. He's in you know love with his wife for however many years, and all their grandkids, and and uh, the way he was able to do that in a public spotlight, I think, was fairly impressive. Um, I love the way Larry Miller. I read his book, Driven, a uh, great book. Uh, I love the way he has really given back to the community and created this legacy. Um, you know, I think. John Huntsman Sr. is that way. I, I read about some of him, you know, just these individuals that have had um, their word is their, their um, is, is like binding. Um, they care about people. They're building a great business, but also giving back. They're leaving a legacy. It's not just about the almighty dollar. There's more to it than that. Um, and so Bob Gay, was, who's the partner mm -hmm. of Mitt Romney, uh, the lesser known, um, you know, I've read quite a bit of things about him and, and uh, some of his talks that he's given have had a huge impact on me personally. Just that it's that power of and. Uh, there's one talk in particular where he wanted to be a, a, a religious seminary teacher all growing up. And uh, he had the chance to go to Harvard Business School. And he's like, but dad, I, you know, like these businessmen are just shrewd and, you know, it's just about the almighty dollar. And he said, you know, and I think it was this learning where he said, you know, that whatever, Mormon chapel, Catholic chapel or whatever it is, you know, you're, that will do a lot of good. But it also costs something to the fact it was like a million dollars to build. And that's got to come from somewhere, right? And and then he's gone on, and so that kind of like opened it up. Like you can do a lot of good. You don't have to be a seminary teacher or do a nonprofit to impact the lives of many people. And he's gone on and had just this lifetime worth of affecting people in a positive way. And and uh, 
so that those types of individuals uh, inspire me immensely and, and I try and read and soak up as much as I can about people like that. Well, you, you, as I think about the pattern in these um, individuals here, the, the theme that I hear you mention is this notion of integrity. Um, in addition to the, this, this power of the and, but they, they sort of, they, they walk the talk. They are who they are. They are real. They're human beings. Um, and that they, they are true to themselves and to their families. Um, there are other examples of leaders that that's not the case. You know, the, the, it's sort of when at all costs, you know, it, it is this notion of, you know, if I'm going to be a CEO, I can't be a family man. And, uh, it's interesting to think about what it takes to transform yourself from that thinking of, I have to make a choice, to I can be my best self regardless if I'm at home or at work here, and uh, and I wonder if it's uh, if it's a mindset, if it's a belief, or if um, if it's something that we teach in the schools or what we could do here to help more people realize they could have it all. I mean, I'll give you another example here. I was talking with uh, a female CEO of a company here in Utah that. Uh, um, said, you know, there's a lot of cultural sense of you either need to be a mom or you can be in the workplace and that you can't have both. And she talked about how she realized that she could do both. There were trade-offs, that there were issues, but, but you, it wasn't this versus that, that she could act with integrity and be a great professional CEO and also be a great mom and a great wife and have a great family here. And so... Do you, do you think that these issues are cultural? Do you think these issues are uh, sort of taught from our very young age here? What, where do you think they come from that we, where we can realize it's and, we can act with integrity and be successful in business? Yeah, I, I think that's a great example. And um, I think that the world tells you you can't. The world tells you you can't do both. You can't be this and that. Um, you know, there's not examples of this. You have to sacrifice a to get B and and so you're just ingrained into this is the way it is so yeah. you just need to follow the, just get in line and this is how it is right, right? and uh, but we don't have to get in line and you know we can kind of create our own what is our own kind of ideal scenario and, and uh, there's a great book I'm reading right now it's called High Performance Habits um, and I can't remember the author of it, but it's a, it, is, it is all around this whole kind of topic around the power of and and being your best self. And uh, um, for those that are listening and are passionate about leadership, it's a good book. Great. We'll add it to the show notes to make sure people can connect with that book here. Cool. So um, you, you've learned about the power of and from this book here. What are some other interesting books that you've read recently that you might share with the audience? Um, I'm reading a book right now, um, another one called The Art of Storytelling. Mm. And I believe that uh, the job of a C one of the jobs of a CEO is to, you know, and help people to connect is, you know, if you can present with a story, um, you know, I think that that's a, I, I, if you're in any sort of presentation uh, role, that's a great book. Um, Man, I've, I'm always reading or listening to something. I'm trying. To yeah, that's good. No, that's a great book here. So, uh, yeah. we'll we'll get some information on that into the into the podcast as well into the notes here. Um, you know, as you think about the uh, the things that have made you who you are, you've talked about family, you've talked about role models, you've talked about books here. Um, what role have your employees played in you becoming who you are? What kind of feedback do you get from your team that has been very influential to you? I'll give you an experience. Like I remember years ago being a brand new leader and having a, one of the people that was reporting to me come to me and said, I don't trust you. And it was like, whoa. I mean, it totally set me back because I thought, what have I done to create distrust? And at, for a while I was like, oh, bull, you know, don't believe it here. Finally, I reached the point where I said, I need to go back and really unpack this and understand that. And it was immensely beneficial to have that direct feedback and to learn what I had done that had created some distrust and to be able to make it right here. What sorts of things have you learned from your team uh, that have helped you? I think since uh, I, you know, as I continue to learn and grow, you know, I think early on in your career, you kind of think you know it all. Um, I always say that the, the best parents are those that don't have any kids. 
<laughs> right? They no know doubt. they know the answer to everything. But as soon as you start, as soon as you have kids, you're like, I don't know how to do this. Like, what do I do in this situation? You know, um, and then, and as a CEO, you know, again, early on, you think I have to have all the answers. Mm -hmm. Everyone's looking at me. I have to have all the answers. And, um, and I realized that there are a lot of people, um, most people out there that are way smarter than I am. Um, and, you know, to I try and identify my strengths and weakness, what am I, what am I really good at? And be intellectually honest about that. And where are my weaknesses? And then go out and find someone that, and they may be completely different than you, but that is the best in the world that where you're very weak. And, um, you know, so for me, I just try and surround myself, and it's cliche to say, but surround yourself by people that are smarter than you in, and, and that are more talented than you in certain areas where you are, are weak. And that's, I think, makes a, a great team. Um, you, uh, you know, you, and, and it's okay to be exposed a little bit, to be vulnerable and, and, and depend on others. Um, and so, you know, we've tried, you know, that's, that's what I've tried to do is just build out of that team um, and uh, where there's trust, that there's, there's healthy conflict, um, there's healthy debates where we're going, you know, we're really debating the solution around a problem. Um, and uh, with people that have different different talents and skill sets than I do. Fantastic. This is great. Well, let's go ahead and wrap up here with just a quick little um, set of questions around what describes you as a leader. So would you say you're more of an introvert or an extrovert? Extrovert. And uh, have you always been like that, or has that changed over time? I've become more introverted over time. Interesting. And for what reason? Just trying to be more thoughtful. Um, and... Uh, so there's times where, you know, I just, the, as I get older or, or whatever, I learn that there's, you need to take time for yourself to be able to really just think about problems. And you, you hear that when you're younger, you're like, why would you just, I don't get that, you know? But uh, as I get, you know, deeper into my career, I just, I really value time to really process things and make good decisions. And so... That's made me a little bit more introverted. Great. You a rule maker or a rule breaker? I'm a rule breaker. Um, <laughs> my wife gets on me because she's a rule maker. <laughs> rule maker. <laughs> um, but, you know, I always, I teach my kids. I'm like, there are certain rules that, uh, there are certain rules that you should keep at 100%. Um, and then there are other rules that, who knows why they made that rule? It's a dumb rule, so you know it, it's okay to break them. You know, so I get myself into trouble a little bit with that. But I like to, I like to, I like to push the limits on things. Yeah. Well, it sounds like it's not the rule breaker, but it's deciding what's a rule and what's not a rule. Right. So, yeah. would you say you're more of a leader from the front or from behind? The front. And what do you like about being in the front, or what about that works for you? Um. I think the, I, I like being able to set the vision um, of where we're going. This is what it looks like. This is how you fit within it. And then empower that, per, that employee and give them ownership and get out of the way. So I want to be able to just help people see it and, um, and describe it and know what it feels like. And then, but then I want to just get out of their way and let them do their thing. Great. Fantastic. One last question here. If you were to look to yourself in the next 20 years, what advice would you give yourself in order to make the next 20 years the best they could be for you? Um, man, that's a deep question. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll end on a, on a big one. Um, priority. You know, just what what are what are your priorities, and make sure to define those. What are the things that are the most important in your life, and uh, 
And then are you spending the adequate time, energy, and resources on those things that are the most important in your life? Um, and how often, and, and make sure that you are putting in a regular time check to be able to, to uh, do an evaluation of that. And so if you're off, you can course correct and, and get back on. I love that. I love that. Brock, how can people follow you on social media? Yeah, I'm on Twitter, Brock Blake, um, and on Instagram and, and uh, Facebook, all the same. Just just Brock Blake, and, and uh, or you can follow us at, at Lendio. Fantastic. Hey, thanks for your time today. Thanks, Brett. Appreciate it.